Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1985 release, Life Force. This is one I've been meaning to get to, and this is only my third ever Toby Hooper film I've seen. The other two being Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1. I know we did the second one. I haven't watched the second one yet, and I know some people are going to be screaming their heads off at that. And also uh, Poltergeist, obviously, which I have a review of on my channel. Uh, so it was nice to see you. Let me just say, just off the bat, this looks beautiful. The film looks beautiful. Wonderful cin cinematography, wonderful directing, um, really nice practical effects and visual effects. It looks really good. And however they cleaned it up, whenever they cleaned it up, whoever cleaned it up, did a phenomenal job. When I'm doing this review, I watched it on Shutter. It looks so good on there. The way it looks, how crisp it is, and the fact that it takes place, at least initially, in space, really reminds me of the reissue for Alien that I saw in the theater a few years ago for, like, its 30th, 40th anniversary? I don't remember. Can't remember. In a time warp. A time warp. So, as I said, directed by Toby Hooper, he's also done Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as well as the second one. Poltergeist, Eaten Alive, Salem's Lot, The Fun House, and Toolbox Murders, just to name some. Written by Dan O'Bannon. So it's kind of funny that I reference Alien because Dan O'Bannon wrote the script for Alien. He also wrote scripts for Dead and Buried, The Return of the Living Dead, and Total Recall. That's not all. That's just a, a sampling of some really good scripts that he's written. Also involved in the script writing was Don Jacoby. He's done scripts for Death Wish 3. I've not seen Arachnophobia, which I really enjoy. The 1998 Vampires film, which I believe is the John Carpenter one, and Evolution. That is like a sci-fi comedy that um, I think is very underappreciated. I love that. It has David Duchovny in it and Orlando Jones and Sean William Scott. Super fun. Oh, and um, Juliana Moore. Juliana Moore, I believe, is in it as well. Great cast. Great film. Anyway, this is based on the novel by Colin Wilson that's called The Space Vampires. Uh, I kind of don't like the... I'm going to call them Space Vampires because that's what they basically are throughout this. I don't really like them being called Space Vampires. I wish they were called something else because I think people can read into the whole vampire thing. They, they even say vampire at some point, but I don't think you need to nail it as hard as they do with this, but whatever. The model for the, for the inside of the alien spaceship apparently was... Uh, modeled after an artichoke and if you know that and watch it you can see that on the inside like all those layers it's very artichoke-esque i think also the head of of the spaceship looks very artichokey as well um, i'm just giving you a little bit of backstory information and behind the scenes stuff because there is an insane insane amount of information on this film online if you wanted to you could spend a copious amount of time just reading about life force it's nuts Patrick Stewart has repeatedly stated that Toby Hooper was his favorite director that he ever worked with. That speaks volumes because Patrick Stewart has had a very good career, he's a very good actor, and he's worked with a decent amount of directors. Apparently, Olivia Hussey was supposed to be in the film, but she ended up leaving because she mistakenly thought that her role was going to be uh, Stargirl. I think that's what they call her, the, the female um, space vampire. Uh, and she didn't want to do nude scenes. Well, apparently she was actually going to be given the role of the secretary. Uh, and that was later given to Nancy. I can't remember the name at the moment. And I didn't write it down. But anyway, mix up that cost Olivia Hussey a, um, a role, unfortunately. That sucks. A lot of what was shot of Space Girl uh, was not able to be used for the film because of censorship uh, yeah, I could see where it would be very, very hard to shoot scenes so you're not showing genitalia because you can't really do that. Apparently they had this whole situation where Hooper initially thought that it might be better if everything was shaved down south on, uh, on Matilda May, who was the actress who did that role, uh, that it might be easier to shoot, that you might see less that way. And then they found out when they started filming, oh, never mind, that's not the case. So then they had her grow back like a thin strip and went with that. But there was a lot of like pubic hair drama, apparently. Not not a big deal, but the production ended up apparently being shut down at one point because they ran out of money. Um, I guess that doesn't surprise me too much because it looks expensive. It looks like a very expensive film. They're all over the place. They have a lot of different sets. They did they went big on visual effects, practical effects, 
It looks wonderful. I mean, it's a big in scale film for sure. Makeup artist Nick Malay apparently worked 70 to 90 hours a week on this film. And you can see why when you look at the makeup in this and the practical effects. I mean, it's insane. It has a real Star Wars look and feel to it, which I think is actually very interesting because John Dykstra is the person who did the visual effects for this film, and he also did visual effects for Star Wars. So it was really funny because I was I was watching it, and I'm like, this looks very kind of like Star Wars-esque. And then I looked up, and I was like, oh, John Dykstra did the visual effects. That makes so much sense because he did Star Wars. That's why it looks like that. The visual of these suspended bats on the ship they find is super, super cool. The visuals in general are stunning, like I already said, but that gets to one of the things that I really wish there was more of in the film, which is those bat creatures alive, though. I know we get to see it, and it's a really awesome reveal at the end of the film, but I really wish it was introduced a lot earlier, those bats being alive, and them wreaking havoc as opposed to being in human form. I understand that would have, you know, bumped the budget up a lot, but I'm sure they could have kind of like shaved things off here and there, including runtime. In my opinion, this is a really good film. I really do enjoy it, but the runtime is definitely too much. I think they could have shaved off probably about 20 minutes or so and made it a really tight, really outstanding film. It's still a very good film. It's just that I think they could have cut a bunch down and kind of like allocated their money a little bit better. Uh, but, you know, hindsight's 2020, and also... I don't know how to make big production films, so I'm not the person to ask about that. I'm just giving my opinion. The guys see the naked woman in the ship, and it's like they're immediately horny. Now, there's obviously a reason for that, because being space vampires, just like regular vampires, uh, vampires do make you horny. That is definitely a thing that they do. They are very sensual creatures. They always have been in lore, and uh, that, well, not always have been, but... For a long time, they have been, so it makes sense. The news report that states that Haley's Comet translates to disaster is a clear foreshadowing for where events in this, in this film are going to go, although we always knew where it was going to go because we went into this wanting to see a horror film. It's kind of like a horror sci-fi mashup. The way the initial female space vampire acts toward human men is less like a vampire and kind of more like a succubus. You know, I did talk about, you know, that sensuality of vampires in general, but she seemed more succubusy, especially with, like, the sucking of the life force, which is kind of like a substitute for a soul, basically, which makes it even more funny why, in the end, everything goes down in a church, because life force soul, just saying. Uh, the way she sucks that out, it seems that's much more of, like, a succubus type thing. There are a lot of things at play here, because I would argue that, like, it's got a succubus feel, it's got a vampire, obviously a vampire feel, and it's got a zombie feel to it as well. Like, once those those drained bodies start coming back to life, I was immediately like, oh, this is very zombie-esque. And then it becomes even more zombie-esque at the very end when it's mass hysteria in the streets, it's a pandemic, basically, and everyone running around in the streets are moving basically like mindless zombies. So it really is a mashup of a lot of things, and I think it works. I really like this film a lot because of the reason that I really like the vampire film Near Dark a lot, which is it's very unique, it does its own thing, and I don't think many people have tried to do anything similar to it in quite some time. So, yeah. Um, Dr. Falada, was that his name? Falada? It autocorrected on here. Um, uh, he says the name of the film when he speaks with his theory of life force being present in all living things, even after death. He theorizes that the space vampires feed off of it, which that is where I started thinking this is definitely a substitute for the soul. So it's like the sci-fi version of sucks your soul out, basically. They're soul suckers. Such an outstanding moment when the drained body comes to life on the autopsy table and then that's when I thought it has turned from a vampire film into a zombie film, in essence. I cannot stress enough how much I love those practical effects. Those drained bodies coming back to life are phenomenal. Uh, nice unexpected moment when the drained pathologist explodes into dust. That's another thing. I love the added little detail of some of them when they don't feed 
within a certain amount of time, they just explode into like ash and dust. Really, really cool. Uh, and it's especially cool because you don't expect it. When it first happens, it catches you totally off guard. At least it did for me. And it was just a nice surprise. I was like, whoa, that's an awesome visual. I love that. I was hoping to see more exploding like that throughout the film, but I enjoyed the exploding I got. It's interesting when you find out the crew of the Churchill were being drained and dying, even when the space vampires were never outside of their glass pods. That was an interesting thing. So you see initially when the, the soul, you know, the life force draining happens, that it's within close proximity and the, the it's mouth to mouth it being sucked out. But then you realize that on the Churchill, somehow they were able to just kind of like pull the life force out of the air around them and filter it into themselves through these glass containers they were in. Or, well, they weren't necessarily made out of glass because they're like space containers, but they looked like glass. So it was, that was an interesting aspect. And that's why I'm saying like it's a unique vampire film and I appreciate that a lot. It does a lot of its own thing making up its own new rules. There's a very intriguing mystery created around why Carlson wasn't drained by the space vampires. Uh, somehow he actually was getting stronger. Now I think that ends up tying into the portion at the very end where the female space vampire is telling him that he's basically one of them. And I think it, it was this thing where they ended up they ended up saying, and I think it was Carlson who even said it, that like basically the vampire, the space vampires were going around finding races or different species and draining them, you know, and, and the way it would work is that the males could drain and then they would filter the drained life force through the female who would then, you know, filter it up to the spaceship and that's where it ultimately went. But in order to kind of infiltrate the species that they met, they needed to first take the form of those species to kind of, you know, gain the trust and also understand them. But they also had to have one that they kind of like mind mated with, in a sense, where they start to become like that species. And that's, and that's Carlson. Carlson was chosen by that female space vampire. And that's why she says at the end, like, you're like us. And that's why he was actually starting to feel stronger because a piece, he even says this, a piece of her was inside of him. It was an exchange. Um, mind sex. It's a crazy thing. It was a solid surprise when they hit Dr. Armstrong with the syringe of sedative because the female space vampire is sharing his body. I did not really see that coming. I thought they were actually going after this guy in the insane asylum, but then they nail uh, Patrick Stewart with the sedative, and I was like, oh man, here we go. Nice twist to it. I like that. So the space vampires took a human appearance based on reading Carlson's mind. The female one is literally the woman of his dreams. That's what I assume was going on because they said that like she even said that like she became what she could read through their mind or through his mind, through Carlson's mind. So I'm assuming when she, when that space vampire became female in form, they were basing it off of basically his ideal woman because especially it's especially an instance where she wants to be able to get as close to him as possible. She wants to be as endearing to him as possible from the get go. And the best way to do that is taking on the form of his ideal woman. So literally, she is his ideal. Falada theorizes that these creatures have been to Earth before and is where vampire lore actually originated. This is an interesting way to tie this film to all vampire books, films, and lore in general. I thought that was kind of an interesting move because you can look at this movie and basically say, like, this is canon. Like, this explains or you can use it to explain every vampire story, every vampire film, every vampire book. Very interesting, as like the precursor to how they came to Earth. I like that. The visual Carlson gets of the female space vampire being formed from the blood is very awesome. That's another amazing visual within this, where it's coming out of two people's faces. One was um, Patrick Stewart's character. I don't remember who the other character was. But, like, the blood's just being, like, sucked out of their faces. First of all, that's a cool visual. And then the fact that they're going into, like, this giant ball of, like, coagulated blood that's just, like, turning in the air just looks super cool. Plus, who comes up with an idea like that? It's a great idea. 
Kane makes in good makes a good point to Carlson that he can't understand the female space vampire as a human. He keeps trying to, but it's irrational to try that to think that way. Because even though she appears human, even though they've kind of had mind sex basically, not human. Not human in origin. So the motivations, the things that they do are going to be of their initial species, not of human species. Yes, they kind of try to mimic some things that are human, but at their base, they're still acting differently. They're still space vampires, so they act in their own different ways. And for Carlson to really try and understand it, which he struggles with that a lot through the film, they're saying, look, you know, Kane is saying, look, you can't. Like, you can't understand it. You're trying to understand this. You can't. They're not human. You can't understand it with a human mindset because you know nothing of this species. Makes sense. So the males gather life force and filter it through the female, who then sends it to the ship. And the female needs to share part of herself with the species they are harvesting from to become compatible, like I said, soul sex in this one. So there's mind sex, soul sex. Take your pick. Um, I mean, it's about the same. Well, not really, but, but kind of. When Falada talks about there being life after death, it makes me think that's a point of the film, actually. Uh, what if there is life after death and it's not what we think it is? And in fact, it's actually crappy. And that when you're dead and your soul leaves your body, you go to a spaceship. You're harvested by a spaceship and it's like this messed up space purgatory. Uh, I, I like those types of meditations on taking something that's kind of ingrained in society as, as a lot of people believing in and then just kind of like putting a different twist to it of, yes, maybe that sort of thing does exist, but it's nothing like we think it is. It's actually this way. So I like that kind of mind exercise that comes into play here. After seeing the space vampire bat, I really just wanted more of it. Yes, it looked amazing. That was my favorite practical effects. Like, I love the drained bodies, like I said, when they come back to life. But that space vampire in, like, bat form was so great. And that's why when I saw that, I was like, oh, I feel like we've been cheated for a lot of this film. We could have been seeing so much of that, and we just didn't. So, but yeah. I do think, in general, the very end of the film was kind of eh. I, it didn't have the impact that I was looking for it to have, um... It was just kind of boring as an ending. And like I said, you know, the film in general, I felt like was a bit too long. They could have shaved about 20 minutes off or so, but still a good film. There are a lot of interesting camera angles and movement in this, which helps with the overall feeling of things being off with the film, uh, especially because there are a lot of interesting things that they do, especially in the more like high tension portions of the film, where they're like following a character and they'll just kind of like skew the camera to, to an angle. So like this weird angle. So it's like visually, like things are feeling off with what's going on, but visually things are then off. It helps with that. So I like those kind of like little camera tricks to convey things to the audience. And this, that's going back to what I was saying, that it's directed very well. Cinematography is very good. This really, oh, I already said that for pacing standpoint being cut down. The film truly does move from vampire to zombie in the end. Yeah, I already said that. I feel like the film's species and under the skin had to have been inspired by Life Force. Let me know your feelings on that. You can put it in the comments. Do you think, if you've seen them, under the skin and species were influenced by Life Force? I feel like that has to be a thing because I, I see so many similarities. Now, the final thing I'm going to say about this film to wrap everything up. The film is a giant metaphor for being in a bad relationship. It feels great and is very alluring, but everything is being taken from you, and those around you are also being negatively affected. Also think about how Kane is talking to Carlson. He is the friend who's trying to talk some sense into him, being like, you can't understand this relationship, you can't understand this other person you're in the relationship with, because they're not like you. You're not actually compatible, even though you think you are compatible. Now think about... Hopefully you haven't had, but if you've ever had a bad relationship in your life, I know I have, um, how you were in it and it was so good at first. It felt so good. The spark was there, so to speak, even though I hate that that type of stuff is used, but that spark was there and you were so interested and you were so into it that you could only see what was going on within that relationship, but it wasn't good. 
it wasn't a good relationship. A lot was being taken from you. A lot was being destroyed around you because of that relationship. And it had effects on other people. So this film is kind of that, but made super hyperbolic. Like it's blown up to this gigantic proportion where it's this one guy having a relationship with this one space vampire, basically, and it leads to mass chaos on Earth and potential movement towards human extinction, in essence, as human essence is stolen. So that's just my feeling on it. I don't know. You may agree or disagree, uh, but go ahead and put it in the comments. We can talk about it. So out of five stars with half stars in play, this isn't like the most phenomenal film. I, obviously, I had a few issues with it, but overall really did enjoy it. I'm going to give it a very solid four out of five star rating. Um, so did enjoy it. I like it. I, but this is where I would love to hear everyone's opinion on it. Did you hate this film? In which case, I would love to know why you didn't like it. Did you love it even more than me? I want to know why that's the case. Or if you're even in the middle, I want to know that as well. So let's talk. Let's get nerdy down there. But also do me a quick favor and hit subscribe if you have not subscribed yet. That is your way to repay me for any video you have ever liked, whether that's this one or another one. Uh, it really does keep me motivated as well, so I really would appreciate that. Also, it's quick, painless, and costs you zero dollars. It's not expensive. Zero dollars. It's a deal. Uh, anyway, if also if you could just hit the notification bell button, because then you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos, which I put up a decent amount each week. Uh, but regardless, I do thank you for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.